have a Bible, go with me to Mark chapter 1. You know, uh, so one of the distinctives of Calvary chapels around the country, around the world, is a verse-by-verse -verse teaching through the Scriptures. So right now we're in the Gospel of Mark, and we're teaching verse-by-verse -verse, uh, through this Gospel. And I, I think for today we will... Uh, finish the chapter, and then next week we will be in chapter 2. Our last time we see, really as, as Mark I think is gleaning in his writings from the heart of Peter, we see the first day of Jesus in Galilee. He calls Simon and Andrew, the brothers who are fishermen, he calls James and John, they're also fishermen, and he says, follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. And the word men there, it's a generic term for people, really. So he's saying, follow me and I'll make you fishers of people. Not follow me to heaven, although he'll take them there one day. Not come with me and study the law and theology, although he'll teach them all about theology. He'll teach them all about scripture not follow me and I'll make you a great rabbi, but he says, follow me and I'll make you fishers of people. I, I will give your life a, a purpose and a passion that it's never had before. Under my authority, his rule, I'll give you a mission, he says. And so he teaches that first day in the synagogue on the Sabbath and, and people are astonished at his authority. And they're astonished because a, a, a man with a demon speaks up and Jesus casts out the demon. And we ended our last time here in the Gospel of Mark chapter 1 with, with these verses. Verse 27, they were all amazed so that they questioned among themselves saying, who is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority he commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And immediately his fame spread throughout all the region around the Galilee. So let's pray together. Lord, as we jump back in and open back up this amazing gospel of Mark, we, we pray that our hearts would be open to hear your voice. That you would call us to follow you that you would remind us that we have this mission of fishing for people. And Lord, that you have all authority. And help us, like these early believers, to be amazed by who you are and what you have to say to us. Lord, open your word to our hearts today and help us to open our hearts to your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Verse 29, now as soon as they had come out of the synagogue, his teaching, the casting out of the demon, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. But Simon's wife's mother lay sick with a fever, and they told him about her at once. It's still the Sabbath. In fact, the Jewish day ends at sunset, and the Sabbath will end at sunset. And Simon and Andrew, it tells us here, have a home by the sea in the town of Capernaum. And if you ever go to Israel, you get to go to the city of Capernaum. And there's an excavated synagogue there that most likely, it, it's, it's confirmed by most scholars that it's the site of the synagogue where Jesus taught and where he cast out the demon although it's a synagogue that's built over top of the synagogue where Jesus actually was teaching. And then if you look off to your right, if you're facing the synagogue kind of behind you, there's a church that's built over, which many believe was the house of Simon and Andrew. And it's, it's, it's very close to the synagogue. You can walk there in less than two minutes and, and see this house. And so they, they leave the synagogue they, they go to this home, and Simon is married. It speaks of his wife. His mother-in-law is either living there or visiting, 
and it tells us that she is sick. Mark says here, as we, we looked at the scripture, Mark says that Simon's, verse 30, wife lay sick with a fever. In Luke chapter 4, it says she suffered with a high fever. And verse 31 tells us, so he, speaking of Jesus, came, took her by the hand, lifted her up, and immediately the fever left her, and she served them. He lifted her up. It's, it's really actually an Aramaic saying that means he healed her. That's what lifted her up means. Not necessary that he took her by the hand and lifted her up, but that, that, that term means that he healed her. He made her well or that she was cured. And then it says she served them. An expression of gratitude, a, a proof, so to speak, of her healing, that she was actually physically capable now of performing tasks and duties. So, so it's also a great, I think, response to who is forgiven much, loves much. All that Jesus had done for her, she immediately began to serve. So Jesus has left the synagogue. And we might say today, after church. Because the synagogue service was actually kind of the, it wasn't the temple where the priests were and wasn't all, it was, it was a time of reading scripture, of fellowshipping together, of responding to God's word. So it'd be like for us, they left church, but ministry doesn't just happen in church. They go to the house of Simon and Andrew. And I would submit to you that it should happen that way for us. We leave home. We don't leave Jesus at church, right? We, we don't say, well, I fulfilled my obligation church this week. I, I, I was involved. No, we go home to our neighborhoods, to our schools, to where we work. Ministry is not a church thing, and it's not confined to being a pastor. We're all in the ministry. Uh, people I could never talk to or have the opportunity to meet, you have opportunity all week long to rub shoulders with at work, at school, at home. It's a great picture, if you will, of taking Jesus into our world. Simon takes Jesus into his world, takes him to his home, takes him to his mother-in-law. Jesus touched the lives of those around us and near us. It's not confined to the synagogue or to church. I'll never forget when, when my older brother, uh, Yancey, began to witness to me when I was 18 years old. He, he had gotten saved. And he kept talking to me about Jesus. He gave me a Bible. And so I went to church finally. And I found the Lord. And I remember Yancey and I would go home to, to my mom's house. He wasn't living there, but I was. And we started talking to my mom and my stepfather about Jesus. And my stepfather was this kind of real stern German guy. His last name was Schluter. He had lots of tools out in his uh, carport. He was always working on stuff. He's very meticulous. And he was, he was a little foreboding to me. And we started telling him about Jesus. Start and, and my mom and my, my stepdad's first response was, yeah, 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 yeah. You guys are into something else now. It was long hair and beads and surfing, and now you're, now you're into Jesus? And they, they, were, they were a little uh, dubious, to say the least. But there came a time when my mom got saved. Now, I'll never forget, we were doing communion like this, and we used to have uh, the trays up here, and people would come up, and I made this statement. I said, you know, uh, communion's really a, a believer's thing, where you celebrate the, the death, you know, and the, the shed blood of Jesus Christ on the cross. And if you're not a believer, you should probably not take it. But if you are a believer, then you should come. Now, I'll never forget, my, my stepdad was in church that day. And he used to help take the offering, which was kind of weird to me, but he, he would do it. And I remember he passed the bag one time down the same row. And the guy looked at him, we should take an offering like that. And the guy looked up at him and said, sir, we, you've already been down this row once. And my stepdad said, well, I don't think the preacher would mind if we went down twice. <laughs> <laughs> but, but that Sunday, I said, you shouldn't take communion if you're not a believer. 
And he made a point when he came down that Sunday. He came down and it surprised me. He took communion and he looked at me. And he just smiled. And I thought, oh my gosh, that's his way of telling me I'm a believer. We, we left the church, so to speak, and, and took Jesus to our home. We, we took him to the beach. We took him to the surf shops. We took him to Tasty Freeze. You guys remember Tasty Freeze? We, we, we took him wherever we could. And, and, and people started responding. And I'll never forget the church we were going to over in Pensacola actually gave us a, a school bus. This is back in the mid-70s, back when it was like, um, I don't remember what bridge was there then. But we would fill that bus up over in the parking lot in Gulf Breeze and take it to our church and be full of these young kids with long hair and all this stuff. And, 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 I, and I was reading this passage of Scripture, and I thought, look, Simon, he, he, he left the synagogue, and he took Jesus to his home. He, he, he took him with him. And I think there's something powerful about us seeing this, that, that we, are, we were impacted by Jesus. We know that he's real. We see what he's done in lives, and we take him with us. And it said, uh, the fever left her, and immediately she served them. And at evening, verse 32, when the sun had set, and, and the reason he writes that is, okay, now Sabbath is over. And the people feel a liberty, a freedom now to, to move around and do different things. So it says, they brought to him all who were sick and those who were demon possessed. And the whole city was gathered together at the door, the door of Simon's house. And he healed many who were sick with various diseases. He cast out many demons and he did not allow the demons to speak because they knew him. There had been the teaching with great authority there in the synagogue in Capernaum. There had been the casting out of a demon there in the synagogue. And there had been the healing of Peter's mother-in-law. And it seems now the word has spread all around Capernaum. It's a small town. No social media. But people were talking about this, this teacher who was in town and what was happening. And from church to family to home, now to the whole town. And this is a great pattern for you and I. We have a sick and hurting world. And we have a message. And, and people should be hearing about the Lord, of he, hearing of our healing and our hope. I, I know when I came to the Lord, I, I, my prayer was this, Lord, if you can change me, if you can help me, then here I am. And that's what he does. And I'm sure Peter was standing, can you imagine, here's Peter. Now, now it, it, the way it appears here in Mark chapter 1 was, this was the first day in Galilee they had been called they followed back to Capernaum. They're in the synagogue. Things are happening. And then that evening, Peter is standing at his door, outside his door, and the whole city is showing up. Can you imagine just in one day? It's kind of like Peter standing there, and, and, and he's seeing the whole city, his mother-in-law serving. The, the town is just excited. And, and, and Peter's probably thinking, wow, this morning I was, I was fishing. I was, I was out on the boat. And now all of a sudden, I, I'm standing here at my front door, and the whole town is coming up. This is crazy. This is insane. I mean, his whole life is turned upside down. He's following Jesus. The, the sick are there. The onlookers are there. The friends are there. The family are there. And, and, and this whole thing is going down in front of Peter's house, and he's only been following Jesus for one day. What do you think's going on in his mind and in his heart? He's like, oh my gosh, what in the world? And, and it tells us here in the scripture when, when he, that he heal, healed many who were sick, various diseases, cast out demons. He did not show, he did not allow the demons to speak because they knew him. I, I think probably Peter's standing there at the door going, wow, 
How cool is this happening at my front door? The whole town is here seeing Jesus. Now, they have to get some rest. It's been an extremely long day. So it tells us in verse 35, now in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, speaking of Jesus, he went out and departed to a solitary place, and there he prayed. And, and the word that's used here when it talks about Jesus in the morning is a word that means the last watch of the night. And that's about from 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. So somewhere during that time, from 3 a.m. to 6 a.m., Jesus seems to get up, slip out of the house, away from his sudden popularity, away from the crowds, to spend some time alone in prayer with the Father in a hidden place. Maybe he needed to focus on his main calling. Maybe he needed to regroup his mind and his heart and think, you know, I'm not just a healer. I didn't just come to, to draw crowds to, to be, be healed or to cast out demons. Maybe he's kind of refocusing his call. That he, 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 he's, he, it's easy to get caught up, I, I guess I'm sure Peter was, in the admiration of the people, the wants and the needs, the, the pressure of the crowds. See, Jesus had a plan. And it wasn't just for Capernaum. Oh, well, he came to Capernaum. But he's going to go all around Galilee. He's not just wanting to escape crowds either. I mean, look, let's go back to, to verse 14, where Jesus gives his, his real purpose, his real mission. He says, now, after John was put in prison, the Baptist, Jesus came to Galilee. This is verse 14, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, the rule, the authority of God, and saying this, the time is now. And the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. This was his, his primary mission. It wasn't to draw crowds and heal people. It, it was, he, was, he had this message to rip, repent, yes, from sin, obviously from wrong living. But part of the repentance also was from serving self, from just being involved in my thing. From a self-focused life to a life focused on the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God means his rule, his reign over my life. And being on mission for him. He said, follow me and I'll teach you how to heal people. No, that's not what he said. He said, follow me and I'll make you fishers of people. I I'll teach you how to lead them into the kingdom of God. It tells us in, in verse 36, and Simon and those who were with him searched for him. They, they woke up and Jesus isn't there. So they went out and searched for him. The actual verb tense there means they hunted him down. They, they chased him or they pursued him. So they're looking everywhere for Jesus. And when they found him, verse 37, they said to him, hey, we're not the only one looking for you. Everybody in town is looking for you. And I think Simon's intentions are good. I, I think he sees that Jesus has great potential and popularity and huge impact on the city. But Jesus was not going to be confined or localized. He, he had come for all. And God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. So, so Jesus... As after they find him, he responds in verse 38 and says, Let us go into the next towns that I may preach there also. For this purpose I have come. Now, most of us would think, Jesus, you got it going off in Capernaum. I mean, it's a sure thing, it's, it's successful. There's, there's great traction here, Jesus. But there's a sense within our walk sometimes like this when we think, well, you know, I've kind of reached a place in my walk. I've reached a place in my life. I've reached my, a place in my sort of uh, 
relationship with Jesus, I guess I can just settle here. I, 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 I'm mature now. I, I, can, I can, you know, kind of stop in, in our growth or in our fluence and our impact on others. And Jesus certainly could have set up shop there and said, wow. But he, he said, I, I have come to preach also to others. And listen, there are new people all around you in your life. There is potential to still keep growing and deepening your relationship with the Lord. A deeper surrender, a, a greater availability to Christ. What does Jesus say? He says, let's go. Let's go. Don't limit the Lord. Don't ever get to a place in your relationship with the Lord where you think, well, this is it. This is all he's going to do. You know, I'm this old or I'm, I've done this or, you know, hey, I'm a, I'm a whatever in the church. And we can put all kinds of boundaries and excuses around what he has called us to do and what he's called us to be. And we can settle in to a Christian routine. Jesus, let's just stay in Capernaum. This is great. I'll never forget one time, I, I, someone called me from Destin and said, hey, we're live streaming your service and we would love to start a Calvary Chapel here in Destin. Would you guys come help us? I said, well, tell me what's going on. Oh, we've got this storefront. We've got about 15 people and we're just live streaming the service that you guys do in Gulf Breeze. So I talked to a couple of guys on staff and said, well, maybe we should go check it out. And one of the guys told me, he said, we don't have time and we don't have the money. I said, did Jesus tell you that? <laughs> he goes, no, it's just obvious. We're, we're busy. We've got this kind of budget. We've got this going on. He goes, we really don't have time to go to Destin and get involved in, in anything down there. I thought, wow. So I snuck out and, and went down there. <laughs> And talk to these guys. And I thought, well, oh, these guys seem very sincere. They've, they've got a building that's rent free. They've got about 15, 20 people. They, they want a Calvary Chapel down there. So I, I came back and this guy said, so where you been? I said, I just went down to Destin. <laughs> we don't have time for that. I go, well, how do we know that God's not in it? John, we got a church here and it's growing. And I said, well, you don't know for sure. So I started sending staff down there and taking turns preaching and church started to grow a little bit. And then finally my son, Neil, was on staff at that time. And I, I said, Neil, you should go down to Destin. You're, you're, you're the guy. You, I, think, I think you would be the guy that could, could organize. And Neil's a great administrator and he's a great teacher. I said, let's just go down there and see what the Lord does. And Neil goes, no, I just bought a house. I'm not going down there. I go, really? Okay. I said, well, I'll pray about someone else. And two days later, he came to me and says, Dad, I think Cece and I will go. I said, really? He goes, yeah, we'll sell our house. We'll move down to Destin. He said, I'd always wonder what if, if I didn't do it. So he sold it. He's spent almost 10 years down there, and the church grew. It got established, and now there's another pastor down there. And it would have been very easy to just stay in Capernaum. And sometimes the Lord will speak to you about a friend or, or a relative or, 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 or something you should get involved in to continue growing and stretching instead of just saying, okay, we're staying in Capernaum. A fresh surrender of your heart, your life. A uh, similar thing happened in Navarre. There was this, I was going to a birthday party for someone in the church down in Navarre and someone had shut down the church building down there. And I told my wife, yeah, there's this building down in Navarre at the church. It's sitting there empty and it's got a for sale sign in it. We're heading down to the birthday party and Lynn goes, why don't you pull in and look at it? I go, well, I don't know. We don't, we don't want to get involved in all that. She goes, John, just look at it. Pulled in, we walked around the church. Lynn looked at me and she said, John, this is a no-brainer. <laughs> I go, a no-brainer? She goes, look at this building sitting here. And you've got so many people coming from Navarre, this would be a great place to plant a church. I said, yeah, but if we planted a church here, we'd lose all our Navarre people. <laughs> 
She goes, the Lord can replace them. So we started praying about it. We called the, the sign and they said, oh, yeah, it was for sale, but it's going up on auction. I said, it's going up, going up for auction, John. I Lynn. She goes, well, go to the auction. So I, I talked to the board members. We, we, we had a certain amount of money that we were, uh, I was given that we could bid. I went into the auction. There were some pastors I recognized. There was more than just that one property being auctioned off. And I'm sitting there. They finally got to that church in Navarre and they're auctioning it off. And I raised my hand once. Someone else, someone else, someone else came up to me and said, the Lord had told us, he prophesied that we would have this building. I go, well, that's cool. You better have a good amount of money. That's all I got to say. <laughs> well, well, anyway, we kept going. Finally, I reached, I reached the top of the mount that I was allowed to, to offer. And there was this older guy in front of me who just kept raising his hand, raised his hand, raised his hand. I thought, who is this guy? Well, needless to say, he, he got it. And, and, and I walked out and thought, wow, you know, that's weird. I thought for sure the Lord was going to open a door there. And so we walked, we left, and you know, continued on. And about three months later, I get this phone call, and it's that older guy. He goes, hey, is this John Spencer? I go, yeah, who is this? He goes, I'm the guy that was outbidding you at that auction on that church. He said, I'm the original owner of that building and the land. He said the pastor was there, disqualified himself with some misuse of money, and the bank shut the thing down. He said, so I bought it back. He said, in the deed, it can only be used as a church. He said, I'd like to sell it to you. I go, why me? He goes, oh, I looked you up. I go, you looked me up. He goes, yeah, I know who you are, who your family is. He goes, he says, I've lived here all my life. I'm an ex-banker. I said, well, the price that you paid for it is well beyond what I can do. He said, well, come down and talk to me. I drove down there. We met inside the building. And before I had talked to the board, and I think it was Tony Skaggs who said, offer him this much and tell him that you want to rent to own for three years because if this doesn't work out, we can get out of it. I said, well, that sounds smarter, smarter than what I was going to do. <laughs> so I went down there, had a certain amount. It was the same amount we were going to auction for. And I, he said, so, are you interested? I walked through that. I said, yeah, I think we're interested. I said, but this is the amount. And we'd like for this much to go to rent and this much to go to the purchase of the building. And he looked at me and goes, I'll do that. I thought, wow. He said, not only will I do that, he says, but who are you going to finance it through? I go, I don't know. We, we have a bank we've worked with. He says, I'll finance it. I go, you'll finance it? He goes, yeah, you don't have to get a loan or anything. He goes, I'll finance it. You pay me this much, and this much will go to rent. This much will go to the purchase of the building. And he reached down his pocket and go, here's the keys. I go, the keys? He goes, yeah, you're going to want to show some people around, aren't you? I go, yeah, but I, I don't want the keys. He says, no, get your attorney to draw up the papers. I'll look them over, and here's the keys. Just start showing your people around. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> and now there's a growing church down there in Navarre. We had a guy on staff here for over 10 years who stepped into that role. And, you know, it would have been easy just to say, oh, no, no, you know, we don't want to lose those people. We don't, it's, it's too much work. And, and I think sometimes we get that way in our relationship with the Lord. Oh, I don't want to talk to my neighbor. I, I don't want to get involved in this ministry service. I don't want to do this. I, I want you to see that, that here's how it worked with Peter and James and John and Andrew, one day they're fishing, they're doing their normal thing. Next thing you know, they're standing outside of Peter's house that night going, oh my gosh, what in the world just happened? And that now they're, they're looking for Jesus in the morning thinking, okay, where is he? We got stuff to do here in Capernaum. And Jesus says, no, we're, 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 we're going to move on. You're going to move on. Yeah, I'm going to make you guys fishers of people. And I'll just hear in your own hometown. It's amazing, and I say all that to say this, don't stop. Don't stop growing, don't stop dreaming, don't stop thinking, don't stop following. The Lord has more to do in your life than you imagine. That's what he does, that's who he is. Follow me, he says. And it tells us, let's go into the next town, verse 38, that I may preach there also because... This is the purpose for which I've come forth. And he was preaching in their synagogues throughout all Galilee, 
and casting out demons. Now, we don't know much about this time. It's just one brief uh, little, little section. But he was preaching in the synagogues. And, and thank goodness, the synagogues were the place where they would open the word, they'd open the law, and someone would be invited to exegete it. And Jesus, as a traveling rabbi, got to do that. And he also was casting out demons as he traveled all around the Galilee. A great ministry was opening up. The scriptures were being taught. And it says... In verse 40, now a leper came to him in the midst of this as, as his fame is kind of spreading, as his involvement is, is in these different places in the Galilee, imploring him, kneeling down to him and saying to him, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And Jesus moved with compassion, stretched out his hand and touched him. I'm willing. Be cleansed. And as soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. And he charged, he warned him and sent him away at once and said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go to your way, show yourself to the priests, and offer for your cleansing those things which Moses commanded as a testimony to them. However, here's what the leper does. He went out and began to proclaim it freely and to spread the matter so that Jesus could no longer openly enter the city, but was outside in the deserted places. And they came to him from every direction. Can't get in the cities because he's mobbed when he goes there. So they start coming to him. Now the law would order the leper one with a disease to behave in a certain way. In fact, in Leviticus chapter 13, I'll, I'll just throw up some of the, it says, now the leper on whom the sore is, his clothes shall be torn, his head bare, and he shall cover his mustache and cry, unclean, unclean. He shall be unclean all the days he has the sore. He shall be unclean. He's unclean. You notice a, a word that keeps getting repeated? Unclean, unclean. And he shall dwell alone. His dwelling shall be outside the camp. Now today you wouldn't recognize the leper because most genes are torn and they do have their hair down. But <laughs> it'd be hard to figure out which one is a leper. But it torn clothes, also the hair would have to hang down put his hand over his mouth. When anyone ever came near, he'd have to call out, unclean. Well, the news, apparently, of Jesus' journey through Galilee had reached the isolation of the huts and the distance where the lepers lived. And one leper decided that this might be his only hope. His only hope back in the community, his only hope back into society He'd heard of the miracles of Jesus, and, and Jesus' miracles were in the Scripture, they're called wonders, they're called mighty works, and they're called signs. And they not only minister to physical needs, but there's a great spiritual message behind the signs that Jesus did. Feeding of the hungry, the loaves and fishes is a symbol of the fact that he's the bread of life. In fact, one time he fed the multitudes and they came to him for more. And he began to speak of himself as the bread of life. Anyone eat of me or drink of me. He would give sight to the blind. And it's symbolic of how he opens the eyes of people to see the real truth, to understand for the first time in their lives who God really is and what grace is. The healing of disease. How he restores sick souls and, and, and gives them life again. The, the stilling of a storm. How the Lord brings peace into troubled hearts and gives us a sense of contentment and expectation. The raising of the dead, symbolic of him giving life eternal. Leprosy is this, this picture, if you will, of sin. How it's slow and steady how it grows in your life, if not careful, without check, without cure. Horrible symptoms, very deadly, very destructive. And we can see it in our culture, in our world. The impact of sin, the sex addict, 
who preys on people, the, the, the alcoholic who, who is unwilling to admit the fact that they are an alcoholic and, and they hide it in all kinds of places, the, the drug abuser, the, the one who loves money and, 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 and is willing to cut off any relationship or make any deal regardless of who it hurts or harms because, hey, I'm making money. Well, the leper kind of seems, if you will, to come out of nowhere. He's desperate full of sores and rotting skin. He's unclean. And he says, if you will, you can make me clean, Jesus. Jesus, you're my only hope. I don't have any other hope. And it doesn't say just heal me, but I think it's significant that he says, make me clean. This is the main thing he's looking for, to, to be able to be among people again, to go home, to have a normal life, to not be an outcast, to be saved from the misery and suffering of, of this disease and isolation. He's cut off. And what an amazing picture of God's grace, of his love, of his heart. It says that Jesus was looking at this man, I'm sure, and he understands the situation he's in. He understands what a leper's going through. And it says he was moved with compassion. His heart was touched. And he made him clean. Not only healed him, but he made him clean. It's an amazing picture of God's grace and his love and his heart, how he forgives sins. And how he takes somebody who, who's isolated in life. And maybe you can relate to that. That boy, I was, I was alone in my sin. I was alone in this sort of trapped life of my own. And he came along. And, and, and Lord, you're my only hope. And he brings you salvation. And then he brings you into a community called the body of Christ. And he, he gives you gifts and purpose and hope and a ministry. And, and no one is too sinful. If, if anyone should have not been there with Jesus, it is this leper. It's a picture that no one's too sinful, no one's too far gone. He, he's willing to cleanse, he's willing to restore. And Jesus moved with compassion. And he warns him, sends him away at once. You see this word, Immediately, over and over, at once, in the Gospel of Mark. Mark notes for us how, how quickly the Lord's word is disobeyed and obeyed. But when he touches him, no surgery involved, no physical therapy, no treatment process, no take this four times a day for three months, you'll finally come out of it. Instant healing, instant cure. Salvation is a lot like that. You don't have to go through confirmation. You don't have to go through classes. You don't have to be baptized to be saved. You don't have to do all these rituals or religious procedures. He says, if anyone believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, confess him with your mouth, believe in your heart, you shall be what? Saved. 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 Immediately. Immediately. And he tells him not to tell anybody, but go to the priest. He sends him away. Man, we would have kept him around if we would have been the guy that healed him, right? Taking a couple of pictures. Had a big rally. Hey, this guy was a leper. Guess who healed him? Now Jesus just sent him away. He's not after that kind of crowd. He's not a before and after picture. Here's the leper before. Here's the leper after. Jesus following this mosaic process, avoiding massive crowds that are just looking for physical help, go have the priest pronounce you clean. Well, the leper doesn't obey. And Jesus is now unable because of the crowds to enter cities along the Galilee and they're coming now to him from every direction. I think it's interesting because nowadays Jesus tells us to tell and we're quiet. Back then he says, don't tell, and they're noisy. <laughs> well, we, we have this message. We have this story of coming from uh, uh, 
they're, they're out there mending nets and fishing. Next thing they know, they're in the synagogue and Jesus is teaching. And the people are astounded. And a demon comes out of a man at the word of Jesus. And then they're in the front of, of Peter's house and the whole crowd's coming out and, and people are getting healed. His mother-in-law first and, and the whole town is in Peter's like, what in the world have we hooked up with? And then they find Jesus out praying and Lord Capernaum's happening. Come on back. He's no, we got, we got to go. God so loved the world that, that he sent his son for the world. They go to synagogues and his fame continues to grow. And then this wonderful picture of this leper being given his life back. And I would say to you and to me, listen, the kingdom of God is now. Repent and believe in the gospel. Not just turn from your sin, but let him take your life and give it greater purpose and greater meaning. We, we have a message. We have a story. I, I would encourage you, you know, this Easter, invite someone to church. You don't know what the Lord might touch. The, we, we we're passing out signs today out there in the, in the foyer. Grab one, stick it in your yard. That's one way you can tell someone. You mean, identify myself as a church-going believer? I know it's difficult. <laughs> you can do it. What if I told you, don't tell anybody? I'm not going to say that. Put a sign in your yard, invite someone. If you've never been baptized... We do this amazing baptism out on the beach Easter morning as the sun's coming up. If you've never followed the Lord in believer baptism, sign up. It's a great way to give a public testimony. Let me close with this. Jesus can and Jesus does touch and change lives because the kingdom of God is real. It's real. It's not a fairy tale. This is not a made-up story. Our cleansing and our healing comes through the cross, his sacrifice, the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, we're going to remember that this morning through, through communion before we go, that his body, his blood was given for us, just like it was for this, this, this demoniac, just like a leper. He makes us clean. He forgives us, and he sets us free.